Welcome to an American Homestead, podcasting live from deep within the Ozark Mountains at an elevation of 2,200 feet. It is 9 Eastern, 8 Central. It's winter, it's cold, it's good to be back. So, um, how's everybody doing tonight? Got a jam-packed show, and uh, we're going to talk about some of the beginning steps of homesteading tonight, and what you can do to think about beginning your homestead if you haven't yet done so. Um, I actually got a question today, this morning. I actually answered it before I had my coffee. I was really proud of myself. And I'll go over that question. It was from one of our patrons. And uh, we'll talk about you know some of the concerns that she had. And we'll talk about just some of the basic things. We talked about this today, actually. Some basic things that people can do to begin the process of building a homestead. So... Um, we're going to kind of do, I mean, because I think this is a lot to talk about. I mean, there's a lot to talk about when, you know, beginning the beginning steps. We've done videos on this before. Where we've, you know, you've actually done some voiceovers uh, videos, just beginning things to start your homestead. And um, I want to skip over the one thing we always talk about, how the husband and wife need to be on the same page. Let's just imagine that that's already achieved. Okay. And then we're going to talk about some other things. Um, you know, we'll talk about maybe some finances, um, talk about... Uh, some ways to prepare for a move, um, things like that. And, and, you know, we'll just get into all the uh, the details of that. I mean, there's a lot to go into. And then we'll bring it over to the chat at the end and then see what others say. Sounds good. Mm-hmm. You want some coffee? No. Sure? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, she looks a little tired tonight. I can't help it. It's dark. <laughs> It's when the sun goes down, we go down. Mm. So, um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, so what did we do this week? Well, I did continued with my cleaning and painting projects. Cleaning and painting projects. Mm. Yeah, the shelves look really good. We're, we'll do a, um, I was planning on doing a picture montage of your shelves in the entire home. I mean, they're really, they're really, I mean, you spend a lot of time on everything. It looks really good. I know. I mean, just look at this. I mean. I know. Look at how pretty her shelves look. She has everything super organized and labeled. I know. I. uh, You said it brings you joy. It does. And I probably spend more time than I should doing it. But it, it's kind of a hobby for me at the same time. I would say it's definitely my hobby, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you like reading about it. You like, you know, looking on Pinterest about it. In an alternate life, I would have been an interior designer for pay. Mm -hmm. We talked about that. Or a professional organizer. Yeah, we Probably those two things. We even talked about building her a website. Back back when we were in St. Louis, right? Yeah. About building her a website where, because um, this is something that high end clientele love to, they actually do this a lot. They hire people to come in and organize their homes um, and um, get rid of clutter, to declutter, and to make it look neat and organized and pretty yeah, in, in an interior design sort of way. Yeah. 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 And so. And that's just my thing. I love, I love doing it. I. I just, I love being by myself and putting my headphones in and just redesigning my space. Yeah, so we talked about doing that. That was, that was one of our grand plans, but we decided to leave it all behind. Yeah. And move. It's okay. I mean, now the house is my, (laughs) I, I, I don't draw or, well, I kind of do draw a little bit. I try, Mm -hmm. but this is my, my slate. Yeah. So. So she's been rearranging the last week and. Um, the winner is home projects. And I think that any homesteader um, would kind of agree that any kind of homesteading inside project needs to be done in the winter time because in the spring it's planting a lot of other activities um centered around the garden then of course the summer is all the produce that needs to be canned harvested um put up in the fall the same thing more garden stuff and of course we always camp in the fall and Mm. so there's so many activities all throughout the year but if i'm gonna get anything done inside 
project wise, it has to be in the winter's time. So um, right now I'm cleaning and purging and reorganizing. So yeah, you do you do some of that though in the spring. You know, you do a little bit of spring I, cleaning for sure. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I always clean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just never stops. Just ta- I feel like we talked about this last week. That's okay. People are going to think I'm crazy. Well, I mean, you know, we're all a little crazy. Um, so one other thing I want to talk about today, because it is winter, uh, it's one of the things we do. And I, I do get a lot of questions on this um, over the course of the whole year, but it seems like more in the winter time, which is the appropriate time for it anyway, and that's butchering. Um, a lot of the harvesting for meat is probably finished by now for a lot of people, but really... You know, people who lived, you know, a couple hundred years ago and before that, this was the time of year when you got your butchering done. And um, coming up shortly uh, is going to start the time of Carnival, which actually means end to meat. Uh, Most of the world celebrates that. It's kind of a pagan, you know, tradition and holiday. And in the U.S., they call it Mardi Gras. But um, everywhere else in the world, it's called Carnival. It means end to meat because when the springtime comes... You don't get any more fresh meat because all your meat is slaughtered, and the only meat you have left over is dried, uh, salted meat um, that that has been cured. And so uh, some of you guys probably saw the video I did um, recently where um, we had, you know, a pretty significant failure on the homestead. It's kind of painful to see that, but, you know, you learn. And I've said before, you know, Chris over at Shlowmakers, he's not really doing videos right now. He's concentrating on other things. But I, I don't. Th- I, I think we'll. I think we'll see him again um, in videos, either either on my channel or he'll come back and maybe make some videos here, here and there on his website, or his on his channel. But he really has it mastered when it comes to um, meat curing and hard salami. Um, he, he he does a real good job at that. And so I think my my issue this year is that I did not put enough curing salts into the meat. And while it it's drying, you know, it didn't cure. And that's a big issue. It has to cure. So I'm considering it a failure this year. Um, so let me explain how this works. Because to me, this is really fascinating. This is like, it to me, it's really fascinating. And, and it's even more fascinating when you can taste, you know, what happens when all this is like, we were over at a slow makers a couple weeks ago, right? And he brought out some salami. He always does that. And I love the end pieces. And they are, it seems to me those are the most flavorful, the heel of, of the hard salami that he cuts off first, you know, on a new stick. Uh, it's usually the hardest, and it's usually the most flavorful, in my opinion, because that's where a lot of the mold is concentrated. And that mold really brings an amazing flavor. So how it was supposed to work, how this was all actually, actually accidentally discovered. I, I mean, I was reading more about this, you know, and... Um, this will get into our other topic before we get into, you know, steps for homesteading. Mm-hmm. So what they did is they would go into the mines and they would mine salt. And they needed that, they understood, for curing, for mm-hmm. curing, saving their meat for the wintertime. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times they call it dirty salt because it was just salt mined from, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't being purified. It wasn't going through any processing. So it wasn't like the pretty salt you see in the stores today. It was just dirty looking salt that they knew would keep their meat, you know, good to eat. And what would happen was... A lot of that salt contained potassium nitrate, or otherwise known as saltpeter. Mm-hmm. And what you don't think sorry. this is, this is it's interesting? interesting? This I'm is sorry. amazing. Amazing. I hate being on camera this time of night. It's okay. We'll do it again. You so, we'll, guys, we'll I'm start so doing s- oh. morning shows. Um, so, <laughs> um, so they got the saltpeter, and then after, with the saltpeter, it was the nitrate, and when the nitrate encountered the harmful bacteria like botulism it would convert to nitrite and that conversion of the nitrate to nitrite is what brings that amazing flavor that you can't find anywhere else it's an amazing that process what it does by killing the bad bacteria you know the bad uh the botulism or anything harmful that the salt couldn't cure couldn't kill it would convert from nitrate to nitrite and that conversion uh, uh, emitted uh, something that created an amazing flavor in the meat. And it was discovered purely by accident. Nowadays, most people, what they do is they go get Instacure, mm-hmm. which is a nitrite. It's already, it doesn't have to convert from nitrate to nitrite, but it, it, it does have a really good flavor, but it's just a little bit different. 
And so um, to me, that is just amazing. You know, the history behind that and how people discovered it and how we use it today. And so my goal has always been, how can I recreate that? And so I tried it with celery powder. But I think next year, just to get a good batch in, I'm going to try the Instacure Nitrite. But I do have saltpeter. I have some saltpeter. I actually have some. We use it to make smoke grenades. You can take that uh, with sugar and make smoke grenades. Makes amazing smoke grenades. And I, I don't know. I want to try at some point the nitrite, nitrate, and then see if I can get the conversion to happen. That's what I want to do. This is to me. It's, this is interesting stuff. It is. The problem is, is that I want to eat it i want to be able to eat it well you can eat it oh we can't because it's threw it away (laughs) as of this point i still have invested all of this time and effort into a product that it was good one-on-one time we spent together think of it that way right I think that any other wife would agree with me if she had spent all day on something to just throw it away. And you guys, you don't even understand. I mean, maybe some of you do. Maybe some of you do. But if you've ever butchered your own animal all the way from killing it to ground up meat and a completed product, it is a long messy <laughs> endeavor. Well, it can be messy. Uh, it can be messy. Okay. So. So anyway. I, I I just, I would like, I'm just saying, I just would like to be able to eat it. Okay. Next okay. time, next time I will, I will go the safe route with Chris's recipe. Putting in my request yes. to be able to eat it. Next time, next year, we will, <laughs> we will, we will do it. It, w- it will get done. So um, it's so worth it. If I mean anything is worth it, if we well, get the end product. I know, I know. I mean, and probably next year we'll have a number of rams we can butcher to add to it, so it won't be all deer. It'll be good. Okay. Next year will be better. I promise. Okay, so um, with that in mind. Everyone's gonna wait to see what happens next year <laughs> in the episode of. You gotta wait for a year. How many episodes have we had in this? In this. Uh, a lot, but I mean, some of them have turned out good. Uh, some of them have turned out good. No. Yes, they have. We had a couple like two years ago. It was really good. Two years ago, it was good. It wasn't as good as Chris's, but it was good. No. I thought. I thought it was good. It was jerky. It was jerky, but it was good. <sighs> All right, next year will be better. <laughs> okay, so because so many people ask about butchering, and this is the time of year, um, uh, I had someone give me a really good book on butchering, and so it's part of my library, and I thought I'd share it with you guys. So let's just say you've never butchered an animal before. Um, really, the only way you're going to learn that is to go out and do it. You need to find someone who knows how to do it, and then make you know during deer season or during butchering season, the wintertime, people are, are, are butchering cows or butchering sheep or whatever they're butchering. Um, you need to go out and you need to learn. And so find someone who knows how to do that and then go watch them do that and then p- participate. Um, the second best thing to the best, second best way to learn is, yeah, you can watch YouTube videos and you can read books, uh, but you're really never going to get that hands-on experience with that. But um, if you want a really good book, and in my opinion, it's the best book that's ever been written on this topic. Plenty of pictures, plenty of content, you know, it covers almost every aspect of every animal you can imagine butchering um, is this one right here. It's called Butchering. Poultry, Rabbit, Lamb, Goat, Pork. And it's written by Adam Danforth, and it's uh, got a forward by Joel Salatin. So most of you guys, some of you guys probably recognize that name, Joel Salatin. He does a lot of homesteading-type uh, materials. And so, um, it, and this is full of just amazing pictures, you know, giving you step-by-step instructions. I mean, here's the deal, folks. Once you know how an animal comes apart you can basically uh, create any type of cut of meat, you know, the expensive cuts, you you know, you find in the butcher shop that are, you know, really, uh, you know, cost an arm and a leg. You can do those yourself. Um, You can begin experimenting and and doing some of those those cuts. And so um, all animals really come apart the same way. And um, once you know that, then you can do some amazing different things. And so this is just full of instructions 
and different processes when it comes to butchering animal, plus the history of it and all kinds of other information. So um, really the best book that you can own when it comes to butchering, uh, Adam Danforth, it's just called Butchering. Okay, so check that out if you're interested. A great book to have in your library. You can probably find it on Amazon. I think they normally go for like, I think 25 bucks. Um, brand new, which is worth it in my opinion, but if you can find it on Amazon, you can probably find it cheaper. Um, uh, maybe used in good shape. Um, check it out. Or thrift books. Thrift books. She does a lot of shopping at thrift books. Thriftbooks.com. Thriftbooks.com. Okay. So um, going over to um, some beginning things, some beginning steps for homesteading. Now she's looking at the book. Um, Sorry. Um, beginning steps of homesteading. So one of the first things we talk about is always make sure that the husband and wife are on the same page. If you want to homestead, if your wife is not on board, if your husband is not on board, and you're just dragging them along and they're halfway reluctantly doing so, it's going to end badly. And I always point out, and I was talking about this the other day with uh, the guys over at Now You See TV, um, that, uh, that, that Frontier House we watched on PBS. It's a free, you can watch it for free online. PBS is called Frontier House. And it's a, a basically um, a documentary uh, story where they take three families. Uh, three. Three or four families? Three or four. Anyway, they take them out into the Montana wilderness and they basically start them homesteading. And they have three months to get ready for winter. And it was such a stressful time that Everyone who was married at the beginning of the show got divorced by the end of the show. By the end of the show, mm-hmm. every single one. I mean, it wasn't even real. They weren't even really homesteading. They were under the you know the direction of uh, producers and all this stuff, and it was still so stressful uh, that all the families got divorced. Now there was one family that didn't. Uh, they were newlyweds. They actually got married on the show and yeah. spent their honeymoon on the show, and they they managed to make it. But you know, right, <laughs> so but. but all the other families didn't. I think that. What? What are you thinking? I just, I just think that we know why, and the why behind that is just differing expectations. Right. Um, differing expectations of who's going to fulfill what role. Um, the stressful situations, yes, but I think the number one reason is expectations. Um, Putting it in an environment that they weren't used to, um, they had not defined their expectations and their roles in this new environment, and so they couldn't they couldn't function. Right, right. So that aside, so knowing that that's the, always the first thing we recommend when someone comes to us and says, "Zach, how can we start homesteading?" As long as the husband and wife are on board, fully on board, fully invested, and have right, ex- you know, correct expectations set, okay, that's great. Let's go on now. What next? Um, yeah, and also to, like, you gotta make sure that this is what you want. Like, that's a given. You can say you want it, but right. do you really? You really want it. Well, that that's that's what we're gonna talk about now because that oh, really okay. that that's really what uh, there are sacrifices that have to be made. So um, I was contacted this week, and you know we've talked about before where if someone wants to, if a family has decided they want to do this, you know, and they, they, the most the modern American family today has so much stuff. One of the other first things we recommend is start getting rid of stuff, and that was one of the first things we did. We started selling things at garage sales. We started taking you know carloads of stuff over at Goodwill and dropping it off. We started donating things, whatever we could do to get rid of stuff. We had so many, so much, so many things. Yeah. And some things that were valuable that we we could sell and I mean, use for money. We had moved a lot. We moved more than every year the first four or five years of our marriage. But I guess what I didn't realize was how much stuff we had stored. Mm-hmm. Um You kept it pretty organized, but we had what, a lot. But, we, but but when we finally moved into our rental house when Joshua was not quite four, uh, stuff started just arriving. Zach had, I mean, he's still pulling his stuff out of his parents' attic and basement. <laughs> that, that just blows my mind. Like, we've been married. You could, Okay, I'm sorry. It's a touchy subject. 
It's okay. <laughs> I, I, I still have stuff at my parents' house. The stuff. The stuff. Get rid of stuff. You have to get. You have to unload these things because it's like a, a ball and chain around your ankle, around your family that prevents you from moving. Because what are you going to do with it all? How are you going to move? It costs money to move stuff across country or even across state, um, or even out of this, just out of the city. Uh, that's just more work for you to do, and more of a logistical nightmare for you to try to, you know, overcome. Well, number one. I really, truly believe that a homesteading lifestyle means a smaller house. Just for the mere fact that you have plenty of other stuff to do with your time other than keeping up with a large house and everything that goes along with that. So a smaller house means automatically you're going to have less room to store your stuff. And so you're going to have to downsize. Right. Um, You know, we've heard this time and time and time again from people who have moved out here and other places too, that a homestead is, comes along, even if it does have a house on it, comes along with a smaller home. Usually. Yeah. And all of the stuff that comes along with a homestead is... And also, too, a homestead house really does go through the ringer um, just in in terms of what it's put through more than a, a regu- what I would say a city house does just because of the amount of dirt coming in. Um, you're not in a little pristine, urban, sidewalked area. So I, I really do feel that it takes a lot more effort to keep a farmhouse than yeah. it does a city house. So, and I think at some, I don't want to get into it tonight, but I think at some point soon we're going to need to do a, a video on minimalism. I mean, that's something that's a hot button topic for you anyway. And I think yeah. um, all the benefits you can get out of um, switching your mind over into a more minimalist uh, mindset. So, um, well, we will take it from a homesteading, farming kind of mindset rather than a pure minimalist yeah. mindset, because uh, you know the the quintessential minimalist movement that you think of yeah. is very very limited things, which does not cater to any kind of homestead or preparedness mindset. No, you need things for homestead and for preparedness. Um, so what I want to get into tonight though, is just talking about, you know, the, the first steps and that one of those first steps being is unleash all this stuff, get rid of it, you know, give it away, sell it. And, um, that brings us kind of to our next step and that's finances, because I think so many people have issues with finances. I want to show this, um, I don't know if I'm not gonna I'm not gonna show it on screen because I don't want to give the person's name because she didn't give me permission to read this, but um, okay, so she says, uh, "Hey there, um, an American homestead with finances. It's always different for." Oh wait, wait, that's my response. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> Oh, okay. hi, Zach and Jamie. I apologize. I know I ask a ton of questions, but I trust your opinions. Laugh out loud. I left my full-time job a year ago, year and a half ago, and so I could focus on being a wife and a mom. The work I was doing from home has dried up, and I'm exploring other avenues of income that will allow me to be home. But I've got nothing so far. My husband pays all the main bills. I have a car payment and pay our, ve- pay our vehicles and home insurance. So I'm getting down to the wire, and the bank account is all but empty. This really has me feeling the pressure of going back to work outside the home. This is not at all my desire. So I guess my question is, where do my goals, especially financial goals, fit into my walk? I want to be as obedient as I possibly can, and I want to be a good steward of my roles as wife and mom. Um, and the reason I liked this um, this letter was because it fits so, I think, good into this homesteading mentality where people are saying, how do I begin to deal with this financially? How do I, you know, how do I afford a homestead? And I, I think, I mean, I'll get your thoughts too, but I think one of the first things is, is to get out of the mindset that you have to have one job. You know, the breadwinner of the home doesn't, historically, and you've probably seen this throughout your reading of Laura Ingalls Wilder lately, that they had multiple revenue streams 
throughout the year, multiple revenue streams. So he had lots of different jobs, you know, seasonal jobs that would happen um, and that he would make money from. And that's been the same way for us. You know, I have a web developer's job. I have, we sell seeds here. We do this, we do that. And it's the same way for most of the other homesteads out here. You know, certain types of year, they, they, they sell their hay. They sell their cattle. They, they just have lots of different um, ways that they can make money, different revenue streams, usually about a half a dozen sometimes or more um, revenue streams that they can use to begin to have the finances to live um, and make ends meet. But the second thing, and this was part of the things that I, I recommended to her, was um, minimizing your payments. And so this is where I think people have a hard time. Are you willing to make the sacrifices necessary to get rid of things that you want? Not what you need, but what you want. People want to have a Netflix account. People want to have cable uh, bills. People want to have multiple cell phone uh, cell phones in their family. Uh, people want to go out to eat, you know, multiple times a week. Um, people want to all these things add up. Um, people want to have multiple cars, you know. Yeah. You know, and, and for a while there, I mean, we were down to really one car. And, We've had one car for a long time. You know, and, and I understand the need to have, you know, people like to have two cars, but can you get by with just one uh, and not have two? Or if you have some people have three or four, can you get by with just two instead of three or four? Um, where can we cut costs? What can, you know, I always bring up when I sold that Stormtrooper outfit. I had a really, I, I was really big into Star Wars when I was in college. I love Star Wars. Not so much today. But I bought, when I was in college, people can't believe I, I could afford this in college, but I got some money, um, and I think it was when I sold that that movie theater thing I, I, I found at one time. Anyway, I, I, got, I got into some money, and I, I stupidly, as a young young kid, bought a, a, a real, I mean, Stormtrooper outfit, like movie quality set, Stormtrooper, you know, uh, Galactic Empire Stormtrooper outfit. I mean, it was 1300 bucks, and um, I built it. Myself, I had, my helmet had even audio and everything in there. And it was just something that was kind of sitting there and I wasn't really using it. I was using it sometimes to like go to different places and hand out gospel tracts. But really, it was just sitting there and it was worth money. And I think a lot of times people have all these things sitting on their house that they could actually sell and turn those things that they're not really using, that they don't really need. It's just a want, it's a, it's a, it's a like, and they could turn that into money. What are your thoughts? Oh, I mean, I just, I know that this is a hard, a hard topic. It is topic. hard. It's hard. And, and I, I'm not here to say that. How what, bad do you want it? What, well, I'm not here to say that what we did is the only way, but I think that Zach and I had, when our son was born, we knew that I had to stay home with him. And we went through a lot of financial difficulty because of that decision. And I always tell people that had we to do it over again, I mean, we bought a house we couldn't afford. It was stupid. Like, we made a really stupid decision. I mean, there was no other way to describe it. We were just doing... What, what everyone, everyone else, else did, you know, and I think that that was the first time we, re after we had our house foreclosed, well, it was foreclosed because I decided to stay home. Mm -hmm. And that was the ramification of that decision. And so we moved into a very, very small, very small two bedroom apartment. And um, before they foreclosed, so I didn't have bad credit. <laughs> I mean, we knew it was going to happen, so we we're just, we're we just, just left. trying to figure it out. But that, that, see, that's another and thing. That was another point. We decided we, we knew this was going to happen, so we were like, "How serious are we about keeping you home? Are we yeah, are we so I serious mean, that we'll let the house go and go bankrupt?" And and it and it wasn't the greatest apartment either. It was it was walls, and I mean, it was fine. We lived there for not quite three years. No laundry. You know, just two bedroom, two bedroom apartment, very, very, very small kitchen. But I look back on that as one of the times in our life where I felt f more freedom. That was the first time because 
we let go of the ball and chain Mm -hmm. and we moved on Mm -hmm. and in that little itty bitty i'm serious maybe 50 square feet kitchen if that um a little bit of itty bitty counter on each side of the sink was all i had and so i did a lot of cooking on the table um I learned how to make yogurt. I learned how to can. Um, I learned how to soak my beans, cook my beans from scratch. I learned how to make bread. That's what we talked about. We started made, homesteading before we homesteaded. I made butter for the first time. Um, I used to drive to the farm and get raw milk. Like, um, yeah. So I, I think that I was finally able to do those things because that's what I wanted to do after we let go of of the financial issue that we were facing. Um, I was able to shift my mindset instead of stop worrying about that and trying to figure out another income that I could do, I was able to focus more of my time on homesteading-ish kind of activities, practicing homesteading. Um, I don't know. Well, I mean, I feel like that that still addresses the topic we're trying to discuss about how how you get started well yeah because when people come to me and i say are you serious about really wanting to homestead they'll say yeah zach we're really serious are you willing to walk away from a house are you willing to declare bankruptcy and allow the court to take everything that they want away from you away from you are are you willing to go to those lengths if you're really serious, because here's the, the reality is, here's the deal. That's why the husband and wife need to be on the same page and be completely in unison on this. Because we live in America. And the reality is, because we live in America, if you and your wife are a team and you work really hard, it doesn't matter how big of a hole you find yourselves in. You can dig yourself out. Okay, If you work together and you work really hard at it, you can do it. And so you live in a country where that's, where that's available to you. Um, and so I am not, I have no, no defeatist mentality whatsoever. You can do it. You have to work really hard and your spouse, if you guys make a great team, you can do it. So I tell people, are you willing to walk away from your house? Are you willing to let a a car get repoed or just turn it over to the bank, um, to, to what's owed? Are you willing to do those things and destroy your credit? Credit in this country is completely overrated. Um, it's all about, you know, keeping up with the Joneses and, and, you know, they, you, you're pummeled with this on the radio and TV all the time. Having good credit, good credit, good credit. Um, and it doesn't matter. You can get rid of, we, we declared bankruptcy, um, after, shortly after we moved off grid because we wanted to get rid of all the debt. Um, and we walked away from a house because we, we knew it was bringing us down. And so are you serious about doing something like that? If it, if it's called for, if it's called for, it doesn't, it doesn't, everyone's going to be different. So your situation is going to be different, completely different than somebody else. But if it's called for, and that's what you need to do. Are you willing to do that? If you and your husband or you and your wife are are really teamed on this, teamed up on this correctly and willing to, you guys can do that and make it happen. And what you'll come out with a, a number of years later will be a success story. I guarantee it. It'll be a success story. Um, it's just, um, you have to do, it's hard. You know, we went, you know, like I said, I told people before, we went a whole year just eating beans and rice basically. And the kids, you know, and they, they, to this day, oatmeal for breakfast. And the kids to this day will not eat oatmeal because it we was, ate it yeah, for an entire year. It was oatmeal every morning. So it's like, are you willing to sacrifice to get what you want? Um, and usually when I ask those questions, then they're like, they, they don't think, they didn't think it was going to be that tough. Um, but it could be. How bad do you want it? Because you can get it. I'm telling you, you can get it. But there may be some dues to pay along the way because... All of us, all of us, especially us, have were so deep into the American materialism mindset that it took us, you know, getting into a big hole and and working our way out of it. Um, but I, I'm I'm here to tell you it's worth it if you can do it. Um, but again, it'll be different for everybody. You might not find yourself in such a big hole. You know, I mean, if if you're if you have good work ethic and you can work your way out of that hole quick, you know, you might you might not have a big as hole as we did or someone else might, but. Um, I'm here to tell you that you can do it. The, again, the biggest thing is having your spouse on board, you know, that team, and weathering that stress because it'll be stressful. Um, and kids too, if you can get, I mean, you know, older older kids sometimes it can be tough for them. I think younger kids like us, for us, we had you know young children, so it wasn't as as stressful. Well, yeah, I mean, the kids is a whole other other issue. It just it, it depends how. They've been raised thus far. 
mm-hmm. and and how they um, trust mom and dad and lots of lots of different things. But the younger the kids are, the better. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you do it before their preteens, mm-hmm. definitely I would say strive for that. Mm-hmm. You know, if that's not your situation, that's it's not impossible for sure. Um, yeah. But definitely, if, if, if you have this kind of long-term goal, I would say work at it before they are preteens. So let's review. We have husband and wife on the, same, on the same team, right? Okay. And then we have finances, doing what's necessary to get your finances in order and, and throw off the things you don't need. Um, asking yourself, am I willing to sacrifice um, you know, for what I want? Am I willing to give up things, the, the things I want for the things I absolutely need? Um, you know, are, are, are those, can you do that? Uh, and then, you know, let's, let's take it a step further and then, um, oh, I forgot my next point. Um, I should have wrote this down. See, I'm not organized. She would have had notes. I, um, you always, you always <laughs> organize this um, podcast. I can't remember what it was. Was it? Was it more about stuff or was it? Oh, I know what it was. Setting expectations on what you consider a homestead. So I think a lot of people are like, they see someone like us or some of these other YouTube channels who have like 100 acres or more or 50 acres. Mm-hmm. We have 56 um, and they or 20 acres. And they think, oh, I have to have that as a homestead. You don't. You really don't. You know how much you can do with just an acre? And one acre, because keep in mind, you know, some of these subdivisions that you see in the city, um, even the guys with the big backyards, they're on like maybe a fourth of an acre, you know, the big ones. Some people on quite a lot less. Now, give yourself a whole acre. If you know how big a whole acre is, you can do amazing things with that. On a full acre, you can do have a pretty good sized garden and even some room for chickens and maybe even a couple small livestock. You can probably do that on an acre, um, small livestock. But, it, you know, it, let's just say two acres or five acres. The poss- things that open up to you, the possibilities are just enormous. So don't think that you have to have this dream. I know people, they, they, I get emails and they'll say, Zach, I'm so frustrated. I don't, think, I don't see how I'm ever going to get my, my homestead. And I'm like, well, what's your, what's your idea of a homestead? You know, what's your expectations of a homestead? And, you know, it's 100 acres and it's, you know, the white picket fences all around the, the, you know, the entire hundred acres and, and horses and cattle and, you know, a nice farmhouse. You don't need all of that, you know. Well, it, it's I mean, just, you're, also too. Lower the expectations. Uh, we've seen plenty of people who want that and have tried to get it. And then they've got their property, but then you know, the husband has to go to work. Mm-hmm. And so what then happens? Like the yep. wife is left to deal. And I, I, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to use that word, deal, because there's only so much she can do on a regular basis without burning herself out and resenting her husband for being gone. Yep. Yeah. You brought me um, out to this place. And because now you left whether me? she wanted it or not, you know, she probably did want it. Right. But she wanted it together. She she wasn't she didn't sign up for being left with the brunt of the responsibility on a day to day basis. And I've seen that several times now. And my heart goes out to those women because I wouldn't want to be in their position. Yeah, we've seen it several times, and it's it's usually ended badly. Um, not you know for the marriage so much, but they usually just give up and move away. And yeah, I, and and then you have to reevaluate your priorities, and then okay, so why didn't we just get a smaller property to start with? You know, mm-hmm. it's like we should have just, you know, biting off more than you can chew mm-hmm. right. is a is a big, big and, and problem. that and that goes into. Before you get to that point, maybe develop a couple different revenue streams. You know, find a placement. It likes to say a lot of jobs, people work online. They can work online. Like I work online. I can have a job online. Um, and so if you are, you have that ability, maybe work that out. You know, have some clients that you can have set aside for a, an income stream right away. And then maybe have some other ideas, some other things you're going to 
uh, eventually mold into income streams um, now that you're on your homestead. Maybe um, stay away from the multi-level marketing. People, Somebody asked me this week about um, earning extra income. I think it maybe it's the same person. And I said, stay away from the multi-level marketing you know, deals. Uh, you know, Work from home and sell this product, and you can be a sales rep of blah, blah, blah company. I don't. I don't. Yeah, I know a lot of women do it as a hobby. I know, but do they really but make any money? No, on I it? don't. I mean, I mean, you probably the majority of people don't. No, but I mean, if it's your hobby, I would say. If but. it's your hobby and you like doing it, great. But if you're trying to actually pay bills, because we all have to pay bills, and you're thinking that this is going to be the thing, listen. The only people who actually make money on those things are people who are really go getters, and they're really out there, and they're in the city, and they're knocking on doors. Lots of doors and lots of phone calls. And, you know, they're hustlers. If you can do that, great. Um, but the majority of people I know can't do that. And, and it's just, you know, it, it's that, that being in sales like that is stressful. I was in sales early on. So um, before I was married. So find something else other than that uh, to create revenue streams. There's lots of options out there. Lots of home businesses that aren't multi-level marketing. Uh, save yourself the stress of that. But start to work those things out now so that when you get to a homestead, you have maybe one or two revenue streams that are possible, you know, starting off. And then maybe some other ones that you can develop, some other ideas uh, that you can go ahead and develop into revenue streams. But start thinking about that now before you move, before you, be, you, get, you have the homestead. And you're like going, oh, my gosh, I have payments to make. And then, you know, don't jump into all the other things you see people do. Don't go out and buy bees. Don't go out and buy a bunch of head of cattle. Don't go out and buy, you know, you know, whatever. Uh, maybe start with just a couple chickens for the next year or two and, and see how that works. Um, and then maybe a couple other things, one or two other small things. Just slowly work into it. But I know some people, I think it stresses them out because they get a homestead and they're like, we got to do bees, we got to do livestock, we got to do chickens, we got to do this, we got to do that. You got to have crops, we got to have a garden. And burnout unless you were raised mm -hmm. to know how to do all these things there's a big learning curve on some of this stuff yeah um i i, I just i feel like we can only do so much and then you know if we're trying to earn a living on top of it yeah um or you know for moms if you're trying to homeschool your kids on top of it um <laughs> I mean, the days, the days fly by. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, start small if, if you can. There's nothing wrong with starting small, you know. And let's just say you get a couple acres and, you know, five years down the road, you know, you, you, you've got this mastered. And you know what? You really want to get the 50 acres. And if you're in a place to do that, okay, maybe you can upgrade. You know, think about doing that maybe in 10 years or five years or something. But um, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing, there's nothing small about having... Um, one acre or two acres or five yeah. acres. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is just a small example. But, you know, people ask me, well, why don't you do sourdough anymore? Why don't you make kefir? Why don't you do whatever? Um, why don't you do kefir? <laughs> I like kefir. Yeah. <laughs> I like sourdough, too. I know. I, I know. We already addressed that last week. I know. We just I don't know. eat a lot I of bread. I know. Okay. Like I said, this is an example. This is not an argument over. Anyway, okay, so um, try different things. So I've done a lot of experiments in the cook in the kitchen, like just trying different things. And you know, it, to, to say that I will never make sourdough again, that's not true. I'm sure I'll make it again, or I'll make kefir again, or I'll make water kefir again, or a kombucha. Or, you know, yogurt or butter and cheese and all of the gamut of things that I've done. But not all of them all the time. Um, I, would be, I would be doing nothing else with my time ever. So I think that whatever it is You that... see when the kids are done homeschooling, you'll make sourdough bread all the time for me? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Ooh, I got a maybe. I mean, I don't even li I don't even eat a lot of bread. I mean, uh. <laughs> okay. So you get our point. I'm right? saying oh, yeah. try right. things. Right. See what you like to do. 
see what ignites your spark of interest. Right. Like, what's your passion? Because honestly, you cannot sustain anything if it's not your passion. Right. It's just going to be drudgery. Right. Right. So, so, make, so make your passion sourdough bread. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's move over to the comments. It's like uh, 8.45, so um, move over to the comments and see what goes on there. Um, uh, let's see. Hey, guys, be sure to smash the like button if you could. I really appreciate it, guys. Um, hit that like button and check out. We have seeds for sale right now over at our website. We have achicha, papalo, sh uh, shishito, Peppers, amazing peppers. Those are amazing peppers. You'll never have a better producing pepper than the shishito pepper. Um, we have the uh, sugar cane seeds, and we have, I think, the Ozark Mountain potato squash is about sold out. We only have a few more of those. Really? Yeah. We're going to be sold out of those before we get to Baker Creek. I'm sorry. It's just not going to – we don't have enough of them. We're almost all out. So, um, But if you want the papalo, amazing, like cilantro and the achicha, try the achichas and um, the shishito pepper and um, the, the cane sugar seeds. I mean – would be so great to have some cane sugar for your kids to chew on in the fall. They'll love it. Um, but yeah, get some of those seeds. And then um, we have right now, just for a limited time only, is the Gunner Ram t-shirt over at our website at AmericanHomestead.com. You can order the Gunner Ram t-shirt. It's going to be only for sale for another 10 days. And it's all going to be gone forever. Okay. Um, so uh, if you have comments, you have questions, put them in all caps and we will address them when I see them. Uh, so I see you here. Uh, uh, Mr. Rain says that. Hey, good to see Rain back. Woohoo! Um, how hard was getting used to no AC, especially going to sleep when it's hot at night? <laughs> <laughs> that is a million dollar question, oh. John. I'm so sorry, but I, I like winter time. We um. We have our, our friendly banter about how he loves the winter and I like the summer. Because it's cold in the winter and I don't like being cold. And you he, hates on more being, he hates being hot. In the wintertime, you can put on more clothes. You can put more wood on the fire. In the summertime, you can only get so naked. No. I cannot put on more clothes to get warm. At some point, you just, you cannot... <laughs> Yeah, so um, I like winter. She likes summer. Um, how hard is it to get used to the AC? Listen, it's a lot easier after you do it a couple of years. Um, you know, you get used to it. You really do get used to it. Um, I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. And um, but it is what it is. I mean, listen, you're not gonna die, okay? People live without air conditioning. You know, 50 years ago, most people didn't have air conditioning. 60 years ago, most people didn't have air conditioning. Okay, it's a recent invention. So humanity has survived without air conditioning. You can do it. <laughs> do we like it? Sometimes not. But, you know. Stay out of the air conditioning. It, it's actually probably healthier Stay for you. Stay out of the air conditioning. Yes. If you are trying to get used to it, you just got to get used. You yeah, got to allow just, your body to get used to it. You got to yeah. stay out of the air conditioning. Yeah. You can live without it. Um, otherwise, otherwise, you're not going to get used to it. So, If we miss your question, please repost it. Okay. Would you go into debt with an RV or do a shed convert? I wouldn't go into debt. Don't ever go into debt. Get out of debt. I mean, your goal being a homesteader is to get out of debt. If if that means you've sold everything off and all you can afford is a Home Depot shed to live in for the next two years, okay, that may be your course. That may be what you need to do. We lived in uh, a 25-foot. Um, I don't think it was 25 feet. 23 feet. Something like that. It was. I think it was 21, but. Maybe. Whatever. It was a 20. I mean, specifically. <laughs> It was a 21, I think 25 feet with the tongue. I'm not sure. It's 20, a 20 foot, let's just say a 20 foot trailer, pull behind trailer for a year. Ish. Without bump outs. Without bump outs. It wasn't, I mean, your, your parents were in a 16 foot trailer. Um, yeah. I mean, theirs was a lot smaller. But they lived in a 16 foot trailer for a year. We lived in a 20, 20 ish uh, foot trailer for a year. Okay. Uh, without AC. Okay. And without, I mean, really heat either. So, um, we lived that in that for a year, and that that's where we lived. Well, it wasn't a year; it was ten months. Beans, rice, and oatmeal. Um, <laughs> it did kind of suck, people. I'm, but it we, did. But I wouldn't want to go back. It was worth it getting there, right? It was worth it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's worth it. 
Um, I mean, yeah. I, I uh, having lived it, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to live it again. Farm alarm. Farm alarm built a school bus conversion. They they took. We saw that at Breaker Creek last year. Do you remember that bus that pulled up? That was that was them. Farm alarm. You didn't go inside. I went inside. I did a video in there. I don't remember. Remember the bus that pulled up? No, I don't. Um, they they I think they're still building it, or they have, maybe they have it done. But by then they were still um, getting it, you know, to where they wanted it. I think um, he was showing me some of the improvements. But he built he took a school bus and converted it into a home. You could that's an option. You know, do what you have to do. He, that was that was what they did. Uh, is it feasible to run a fan off grid using solar, either a ceiling fan or a box fan? Absolutely, yes. It's absolutely feasible. What is hard for solar is heating elements. Okay, that's what really drains solar power is heating elements. Air conditioning adult, that also drains you know solar power pretty quick. You better have if you want to have real power for solar, uh, you better have a pretty good sized battery bank, probably at least eight batteries or more uh, for a home. Um, pro- you know, probably twelve is better. Uh, or 16 battery bank, 16 battery battery bank. Um, but if you, I, I was, I didn't know what solar was really. I mean, I was under the false impression we needed a battery and a small solar panel, and our our trailer would be like, yeah, remember that? Yeah. And that did not work. I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, we didn't know anything. Mm-mm. That that doesn't work. You you need you need batteries, and batteries are expensive. So um, you but for a fan. Yeah, you can do a fan. You can do a fan on probably just one battery. Uh, but, you know, you, you're you not going to do much else. <laughs> I mean, that's going to be about it. So if you want to charge your cell phone and charge a laptop or, you know, do anything else or power a refrigerator, you better have some other batteries and, um, you know, a charge controller, an inverter, and, and a solar panel and all that stuff that goes with it. All the wiring goes with it. So, um, but a fan, you, know, you can probably do that. Um, a waterbed will keep you cool during the summer. We should get a waterbed, honey. Mm, no. No. You want to get a water bed? No. I like, I like the water bed. I think that would hurt my back. I just cannot. <laughs> and plus, you feel this ocean every time you roll over. It's like you're... I've slept on water beds before. It's not for me. Mama Hubbard says, check your laws for seasonal camper living. Wisconsin doesn't allow children to live in them in winter. So um, that's crazy. Huh. Wow. But... Uh, again, that's one of the things we've always talked about too is where you're going to homestead, make sure you check your laws and regulations, zoning, ordinances, things like that where you're going to be moving to because some places are a whole lot worse than others. Uh, here in the Ozarks, there's not a lot, depending on what county you live in, there's not a lot of ordinances. I think there's only really two main ordinances here. <laughs> I love how everyone either loves or hates a waterbed. There is no in between. Oh, is they, are they commenting about waterbeds? Right? I mean, seriously. Mama Hubbard says they're comfy. I know. That's what I'm saying. Like maybe you'll find it be, be comfy. There's no in between. We, I don't. I don't want a water. It, it's too much weight. We don't. I don't think that would even go work here. We'll work here. But um, yeah. What were I, what was I talking about? Um, I don't know. Sorry. I don't remember either. Um, okay. You can get an ACDC 12 fifth gen. Will run AC solar only. You can still have AC. I don't know what that means. Low Cash Homestead says, um, 12th, 5th gen, will run AC solar only. Here's the deal. Solar is expensive. Any way you look at it, don't buy that silly, um, what's that name of that, that store? What's the name of that store? Um, you know, the cheap hardware store oh, that people buy. Harbor Freight. Yes. Do not buy solar stuff at Harbor Freight. It, it's gar- Unless you're just trying to learn how it works, but don't ever try to power anything on it, Okay. If you want solar, it's expensive. Solar panels are expensive. Good batteries, AGMs. You don't want to buy lead acid. You want AGMs because definitely they're going to last longer. Uh, lead acid, don't use them. AGM batteries are expensive. Any way you look at it. Um, charge controllers, good ones, are expensive. The ones you, you don't want to have to replace. Uh, inverters are expensive. Wiring, copper wiring. You're going to need heavy gauge wires because that's the only thing you're going to move real amps over. If you use sm- too small of a gauge wire, it's going to burn up your wires. So all that stuff's expensive. Just understand it's expensive. It's not cheap. Um, if Don't go cheap on solar. You want to go quality, okay, So because you, you want it to last. Um, recommendation for solar, buying one or one maybe building panels. I don't know what's a building panel. Buying one by one or maybe building panels. Oh, oh, building. Oh, no, no, no. Adding D- to your don't, panels? She's talking about building your own solar panels. No, no, no. 
Don't don't build your own solar panels. I mean, if you want to experiment and just try it, you know, to see how it works, um, great. But listen, you're gonna you're gonna spend so the price of solar panels has gone down, you know, way down over the last year or two. You can get some really good high quality panels, even seconds. I've seen there was a guy who was telling me about prices on seconds. Some companies will sell seconds, like it maybe it has a small dent in it or a scratch on the panel. Um, and you can get those for almost half price, and they're amazing uh, energy producers. So um, I just assume go ahead and buy your panels. Don't build them. Um, you're gonna, you're gonna, you'll spend a lot of time, and you're not even sure it's gonna work until you have it hooked up. You may have done some of the connections wrong, um, and they won't weather well unless you have totally you know, weatherproofed them. You're not gonna be able to put them on a roof and have them withstand snow, wind, hail, and all that other stuff. So uh, just go ahead and buy buy the panels. Um, Harbor Freight. Yeah. Farm alarm. Thanks. That, yeah. Harbor Freight. Stay away from that. Um, you know, the good on tools, some of the tools you can get there are good, you know, if you can get the replacement package, but I wouldn't buy solar and let from Harbor Freight and just unless you're trying to learn. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, main bearing says get an ambulance 500 amp alternator use with an 18 N horse from Harbor Freight. I mean, maybe. I, I remember years ago, there was a guy who um, powered his entire home on submarine batteries. So he got one of those giant, it's a real submarine battery after out of a World War II submarine. Did I tell you about this? I told you about this, right? Mm, maybe. He got an old World War II submarine battery, and it was still good. Um, it was gigantic, maybe as big as our table or bigger. And he put it in his basement, and he, he said that this would power his house, I think, for the rest of his life. Um that was it. I mean, he was going to power his house the rest of his life. I mean, if you can get that kind of stuff, get it. But, I mean, normal people won't be able to find deals like that. Um, aquaponics fish to consider for Texas, bass, bass crappie, tilapia. Um, it, 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 listen, if it, gets, if it gets below 60 degrees, your tilapia are going to die. Just if it gets below 60. So your best bet is to get um, uh, bluegill. Uh, hybrid bluegill they're gonna grow fast uh, is that really 60 degrees yeah I mean they could probably maybe withstand a little bit less but yeah I would I wouldn't do you're it you're talking on a regular basis yeah not just like one time here and there yeah during the winter time if it gets below 60 your 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 chances are your your not I'm sorry your crappie but your tilapia are gonna die your tilapia is gonna die you're talking about the low at night 60 degrees yeah yeah, I mean, for us, it got down lower, um, but they're not going to grow at 60 degrees. They have to be around 80 for them to grow. Oh, okay. So you're saying they they wouldn't die, but they wouldn't thrive. They wouldn't thrive, and chances are they're probably going to die. It's going to stress them out enough to kill them. You know, you have enough nights like that, it's going to kill them. Um, ask me how I know. We had we had some you know ones that got lower, and they all died. So I'm a mass murderer when it comes to fish. Um, it just is what it is. Um. Jamie, do you school year-round? We'll go a little bit longer on, on questions. Do I school year-round? Um, yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a weighted question. I think that yes, yes, I definitely do. Although we will take a lighter schedule at certain times of the year. So we don't always do everything all the time. Um, there are times like right now that we go heavier on everything, but like um, in the summertime, I'm, I'm talking like probably starting in June, we will do more of like a limited schedule where my son, will, my oldest will still do math because he always needs lots of practice with that. And I feel that when we take that off, it, it's just is not good. Um, and we're always reading. Um, so all of like the, the basic subjects like history and science and they'll, they'll be doing, they, they're always learning something about those things. But do I do the constant everything I have planned in the summer? No, no. We take a lighter schedule. Single man says tilapia won't grow below 60, but I've been told it has to be like, you know, if it's below 70, really, it's not going to, they're not going to grow. I don't know. There's different tilapia species out there, so your mileage may vary. 
Um, listen, if you're in South Florida, tilapia is great. If you're in South Texas, tilapia is great. If you're in the Deep South, you know, where Deep South Homestead is, you can probably grow tilapia and you'll be, you'll be fantastic. But if you're up anywhere besides that, just go with bluegill, you know, or, or bluegill hybrids. Uh, it's a, a bluegill hybrid is just a, a cross between a sunfish and a bluegill. That's all it is. Okay. Ooh, I really like the, okay. Big struggle with purging is what to keep. Never been off grid and need to build the homestead. Seems every screw, nail, book, jar will be handy. Yes, yes, and yes. Like that. That's um, why one, you, you, you only. One, yeah, only. Okay, so you hit the. Sorry, I'm just going to say you hit the nail on the head. I'm sorry, bad pun. But <laughs> um, yeah, that's the big question. And you know what? I still struggle with that, honestly. Six, six years in and I still struggle with that because um, everything kind of seems useful. But, we, but what you have to remember is, is it easily replaced? Now, other than some kind of disaster where the grid goes down for real and everything is valuable, you have to think about, is it easy, easily replaced? Like a jar, a book, a screw, all those things are easily replaced for not much money. So what we found was that when we lived in the trailer, we paid for a storage unit. And what we found was that when we, a year later, when we finally got our things out of storage, Less than half of what was in that storage room actually went into the house and went into circulation to be used on the homestead. Now, that's kind of painful when you've paid all this money to store your stuff and realized how much you could actually live without because you've been living without it for a year. And so when you are forced to live on a very limited amount of stuff, you learn what you really need. And so you've been paying all this money. Uh, it's painful. So my role now is it is it easy to replace? Is it easily accessible to be replaced? Um, I'm going to tell the kids about the. I think it was 10 Eastern. So I think I'm going to tell the kids about the eclipse because they're saying they're watching it right now. Oh. Um, hey, Joshua. Hold on. Hey, Joshua, I think the eclipse is happening now. It was 10 Eastern, so if so, you want to get your shoes on, you can go look. We, the eclipse is happening now. We told our kids they could watch, they could stay up later and watch the eclipse tonight, <laughs> so they don't want to be missing, missing it. Anyway, this, I mean, this really is one of my passionate topics, so I could go on and on. But, uh, yeah, um, don't. I, I think, uh, here, I'll say one more thing. Like, we have a tendency to really believe that the things that we own are more valuable than that same thing um, if we got it somewhere else. Okay, so for example, um, a gla- I'm just u- going to use like a glass. Oh, that- it's 11 Central Standard Time. Oh. That's what Farm Alarm says. Okay, thanks Farm Alarm. Okay, Go ahead. Go ahead. so maybe not. All right, oh, false well. alarm, sorry. False alarm. False alarm, alarm. Farm Alarm. <laughs> Um, and also too, I would say, think about what will do double duty in your life. So you don't have to have a whole set of glasses if you have mason jars. I don't even own any drinking glasses anymore because we use mason jars. So just think about things and how you can use them to be multi-purpose because it's not worth keeping something if you have something else that will do the job. And it will be around for when you want to use it for a different purpose. So anyway. Okay. Anime Anime said, um, I think that's how you pronounce her name. Anime Anime wants to know, do trout like cold water? Yes, they like cold water, very cold water. Uh, Mama Hubbard says, um, uh, what rocks from minerals do, are the boys wanting? I think she was the one who was, she had rock collections or whatever she was going to send, or maybe she was thinking about it. Someone, con- I think that was Mama Hubbard. 
Um, so what rocks or minerals are the boys wanting? So Mama Hubbard, you want to send diamonds and gold. That'd be great. Diamonds and gold. So if you have that in your rock collection, we'll take diamonds and gold. Um, but uh, I'm just kidding. So whatever. I don't know. Uh, the kids really like their rock collection. And I mean, if you find some neat pieces, uh, I'm sure they'll love whatever you send if you want to do that. Uh, so um, yeah, whatever is good. They, they would appreciate that. That's very thoughtful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would love that. Um, uh, let's see. What else was it? Um, okay, well, I think we'll just wrap it up there. Um, how hard are sheep to raise? They're a lot easier than goats. Don't get goats. Get sheep. Get sheep. Sheep are good. Goats, bad, 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 bad. Suck. <laughs> okay <laughs> we are uh wrapping it up thanks again for tuning in we will see you next time on the homestead be sure to check us out online at anamericanhomestead.com and if you haven't hit the like button please hit the like button we really appreciate it and then also if you could subscribe if you're not subscribed already and then go to our website and if you want seeds for your garden this year we do have a few options for you again papalo sugarcane achicha and I'm missing, oh, the shishito pepper. So check them out. All right, guys, see you next time in the homestead. And thanks for tuning in. We love you. Bye.